Today, they're celebrated as some of wrestling's most legendary performers, each making their own unique mark on the business. But if we cast our minds back to the tumultuous decade of the 1990s, it's astounding to recall just how much resentment and vitriol was directed towards the click. Comprised of Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall and Shawn Waltman, this influential group wasn't just calling the shots behind the scenes. They were also wreaking havoc, bending rules, and crushing careers along the way. Their exploits earned them a reputation that resonated through the locker room and beyond, transforming them into some of the most despised men in the entire industry. In this video, we delve into the history of the Click, exploring why their backstage antics made them the most controversial and hated group in professional wrestling during the 1990s. In the late 80s and early 90s, the five men began their individual journeys in wrestling, ultimately converging in to the infamous Click. Before debuting for the WWF, Shawn Michaels got his start in the NWA and the AWA, where he first teamed up with Marty Jannetty to form the Rockers. In the AWA, Michaels first made friends with Scott Hall, who was getting his start in the business. The Rockers captivated audiences with their high-energy performances, and soon they caught the attention of the WWF, signing with them in 1988. Despite their popularity, tensions started to arise between Michaels and Ginetti as they shared an erratic lifestyle. This led to a dramatic split both in real life and on screen, marking the beginning of Michael's singles career. In 1993, Michaels joined forces with Kevin Nash, which set the stage for the Click's formation. Kevin Nash's journey to becoming Diesel in the WWF was a roller coaster. His early career in WCW was plagued with failed gimmicks like the ridiculous Oz. As Vinny Vegas, however, he found some success. Here in WCW, he met Scott Hall, who was portraying the Diamond Sword. Stood. Shawn Michaels noticed Kevin Nash on WCW TV portraying the Vinnie Vegas character and was immediately impressed by the big man. Michaels lobbied for Nash in the WWF and he was signed to a contract in 1993. Nash took on the role of Diesel, Michaels' personal bodyguard. The men didn't know each other beforehand, but they immediately became close friends backstage. For Scott Hall, his early years were marked by personal demons stemming from from a tragic incident during his days as a bartender where he killed a patron in self-defense. Wrestling offered Hall a way to escape from his real-life self, leading him to WCW. However, Hall really wanted to work in the WWF, and he called them every week, month after month, trying to get a job. Eventually, his persistence paid off when he debuted in the WWF as Razor Ramon, and he rapidly ascended the ranks. The three founding members of the Click hit the road together, although they were immediately unpopular with the rest of the locker room. Sean Waltman debuted in the WWF in 1993 as the underdog 1-2-3 kid. He quickly won over the fans with his athleticism and caught the attention of Scott Hall. Fans watching at the time will remember the shocking win that the 1-2-3 kid got over Razor Ramon on a May 1993 episode of Monday Night Raw. Backstage, Hall and Nash took a liking to Waltman as they witnessed him pulling a prank on the smoking guns where he superglued their cowboy hats. Hall and Nash found this hilarious and knew that Waltman would fit right into their group and so he started riding with them. The man who would become Triple H made early appearances in WCW as the terribly named Terror Rising. However, his career truly took off when he joined the WWF in 1995. The clique would hang out together in the same hotel rooms while on the road and would often watch WCW during their downtime. Nash would later admit that their favourite guy on WCW TV was terrorising, and so they were thrilled when he signed with the WWF a year later. 
Triple H started riding with the click, but unlike the rest of them, he didn't drink or do drugs, and so he became their designated driver. In some ways, Triple H became a babysitter for the other guys. In an interview, Vince McMahon said, They all looked to Paul as being a spokesperson. They all looked at him as the voice of reason. They all looked at him as he was the man that was going to pick them up, sometimes literally, and get them dressed, literally, and get them to the town. The men rode to every town and city together in the same van talking business all the way. Triple H would later say that he tried riding with other wrestlers early on but they would just bitch and moan about each other and it was refreshing to travel with guys who were on his level and were happy to talk shop. All five of the gang watched each other's backs and only each other's backs. If one of them had taken things too far the night before then they could be sure that one of their buddies would put them in a cold shower the morning after. According to Triple H, it was Lex Luger who gave the group the click name. Luger has said that the real credit should go to his old running mate, the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, who would click his teeth every time the group were in their vicinity. As the five men bonded tighter together, they even adopted their own gang sign. This symbol was originally used by the Grey Wolves, a Turkish far-right organisation. The click took to hanging out in their own locker room backstage away from the other guys, the message was clear, it was their way or the highway. Almost everyone backstage detested the click, they were utterly hated. In an interview, Billy Gunn said, they were so strong, you only whispered if you got a problem with it, and hopefully you didn't whisper it to the wrong person. I mean, what they said pretty much went at the time. They had justification because they were what WWE was then. It was centred around them. When you have that kind of power, you can pretty much do whatever you want. The Click used their power as a group to influence who they worked with and more destructively, who stood a chance of keeping their jobs and who was going to get fired. For Vince McMahon, business was in the toilet in the mid-90s. Fans were turning away from the WWF in their millions. Television ratings were down, live attendances were down and McMahon was floundering. It seemed as though he couldn't get out of the habit of writing bad records wrestling television shows. He kept on slapping lame gimmicks on wrestlers and lumbering them with rotten storylines. In McMahon's eyes, Shawn Michaels was one of the few hopes that he had left. Michaels was a once-in-a-generation talent that was brimming with charisma. McMahon absolutely loved him. Once, he even jokingly remarked to Kevin Nash whether he could join the group himself at one stage. It's been suggested that if McMahon had been a wrestler, rather than the owner of the WWF, then he himself would have been in the gang. They had their click and they were happy and they were walking around and they were putting it where the sun don't shine to the rest of the guys in the locker room. It made a competitive atmosphere, which is always good. Michaels knew that he was McMahon's golden child and he would use this to lean on McMahon in order for him to make booking decisions that favoured the click right across the card. It was a tactic that worked incredibly well. All of the men were booked extremely favourably going forward. That influence over McMahon didn't just extend to their own benefit, however. That power was used to ruin the career prospects of many of their colleagues too. In an interview, Shane Douglas said, The dressing room at that time was very nervous and scared of the click. Not scared of the guys, scared of the power they were wielding. It wasn't just the guys on the bottom rung either. I know that there was this very strong reaction amongst some of the bigger names in the dressing room that didn't like what was going on with the click. They saw it as a threat to their ability to make money, to their ability to have talent to wrestle and oppose off of. Bret Hart later said that the click asked him to join the group while they were on a European tour. Hart said that the plan to influence the booking for their own gain was laid bare to him. All of us would work with each other and basically we would control who works with who and who gets a push and who doesn't. I just didn't like it. It was too controlling for me. I wish I could say something flattering about them but mostly they were a bunch of backstabbers. 
Not content with cutting the legs from underneath the other wrestlers behind their backs, they would also rub them up the wrong way to their faces too, often parading through the locker room and announcing how much they were earning. Quite often, they would lie about their earnings in front of the other wrestlers just to get a reaction from them. At the time, Shawn Michaels was proving to be a problem on two different fronts. Not only was he part of the clique, but he was also descending into substance abuse issues and his attitude was becoming unbearable. Just incredible said, the clique didn't take any prisoners, they didn't hold anything back. I know Shawn Michaels was notorious, you know, and I love Shawn to death, but he was, and he'll tell you himself, he was a prick. To go into the details of Michael's actions around this time would warrant an entire video, so it's a good job that I made one a few months ago. I'll leave a link to that video if you want to watch it. Safe to say, he was utterly toxic. Michaels didn't care. He had his friends around him, and the boss thought the sun shone out of his ass. The list of wrestlers whose WWF careers were derailed thanks to the click is very long. One notable example is Pierre Carl Houlette, who had been repackaged as John Pierre Lafitte, a pirate wearing an eye patch. Lafitte was getting recognised as an up and coming talent and he was proving himself in standout matches with Bret Hart. Lafitte's obvious talent didn't make him immune to the politicking from the click. In fact, it probably put a target on his back. During a house show in Montreal, the plan was for an indecisive finish between Lafitte and Diesel. This stalemate was intended to sow the seeds for a rematch later on. Shawn Michaels, however, threw a wrench into these plans backstage, insisting on a clean victory for his buddy Kevin Nash. During the match, Lafitte defiantly stood his ground, unwilling to accept Michael's proposed outcome. The match ended in a double countout. This was a big mistake, as he angered the rest of the clique greatly as they watched on backstage. Later, the clique would use their backstage clout to ensure that Lafitte quickly tumbled down the ladder, culminating in his exit from the WWF shortly thereafter. Michaels even admitted to burying him in his autobiography. For Shane Douglas, his entire career could have taken a totally different path had he simply sided with the group. In 1995, there was considerable buzz around him. He'd made a name for himself in ECW. The big mistake came for Douglas when he refused to get involved in the clique's backstage politics, and so, like a pack of dogs, they turned on him. They started to criticise Douglas to Vince McMahon, and Shawn Michaels decided to forfeit the Intercontinental Championship rather than lose it to him in a match. This situation became more complicated when Douglas lost the belt to Razor Ramon just 11 minutes after receiving it by forfeit. Before long, Douglas was sent packing back to ECW, where he continued in the same spot he'd left off a couple of years before. Douglas achieved absolutely nothing but embarrassment in the WWF. In 1995, Michaels got himself into some serious trouble during a bar fight. The clique had been temporarily divided, with some of the team heading for a European tour, while Shawn Michaels and Shawn Waltman stayed in the US to work the house show circuit. One evening after a show, Michaels was trying it on with a woman on the dance floor, which caught the wrong attention. The woman he was dancing with was the girlfriend of a Marine. Without the other members of the clique around to bail him out of trouble, Trouble as usual, the situation spiralled out of control, culminating in Michaels being knocked out after a car door was slammed against his head. It wasn't a shock to anyone in the locker room that Michaels had landed himself in hot water with a marine. It was only a matter of time before something like this was going to happen. Lucky for Michaels, Sonny was sympathetic and she accompanied him to the emergency room. Sonny was the WWF's first real diva. She made her debut in 1995 alongside Chris Candido, her real-life boyfriend. As Michaels was recovering from his injuries, he and Sonny grew increasingly close together, with Sonny keeping a close eye on him during his recovery. They embarked on an affair, and they did absolutely nothing to keep the relationship hidden. Sonny even shared photos from their Jamaican vacation 
location right under Candido's nose. According to Sonny, she and Michaels shared intimate moments backstage at WWF shows multiple times a night ever since many of the wrestlers who were in the locker room at the time have spoken about how badly hurt Chris Candido was. He and Sonny were still an item at the time of course. Other reports have suggested that Candido did stand up to Shawn Michaels on several occasions. This is often cited as a reason for his WWF career eventually failing and the emotional strain of the situation even led Candido to descend into bouts of deep depression. In an interview, Bam Bam Bigelow said, We actually found, I won't say a suicide note, but you know, we found a note in Chris's bag that was pretty heavy. Chris was depressed, man. The depression was because of the click and they loved it. They were thriving on it. They were like, okay, let's see if we can make this kid kill himself, you know? It was just terrible. The Undertaker had a clear view of the numerous ways that the click were destabilising the WWF and in response he formed his own faction known as the Bone Street Crew. Yokozuna was among the original members and they carefully recruited others who shared their perspective. Although it's been stated that the Bone Street Crew never physically confronted the click, Undertaker and his gang did strive to keep them in check. By mid-1990 however, the clique would no longer be a concern in their current form. WCW boss Eric Bischoff was making serious moves to get ahead of the WWF in 1996 and signing two of their biggest players was a huge move on his behalf. And so he contacted Hall and Nash and put an irresistible contract on the table. Hall and Nash both claimed that they didn't want to leave the WWF or more specifically they didn't want to leave their buddies behind but Bischoff made them an offer they simply couldn't refuse. McMahon had no chance of matching the offer at the time and so it was decided the click would be no more. During a house show at Madison Square Garden in May 1996, Hall and Nash wrestled their final matches for the WWF. After the match, Hall, Nash, Michaels and Triple H hugged each other and raised each other's arms, much to the anger of Vince McMahon. As far as McMahon was concerned, Kayfabe was still alive and he was mortified that baby faces and heels were hugging it out in the middle of his ring in this public display of solidarity. To make matters a hundred times worse, a fan in the crowd was filming the show on his camcorder. He caught the entire incident on tape. McMahon was determined that this time the clique were going to be punished for their indiscretion. Hall and Nash went off to WCW so they got off scot-free. Sean Waltman didn't take part in the incident so no blame could be placed on his shoulders and despite his part in the incident, Sean Michaels was the reigning WWF champion at the time and so he faced no repercussions either. So it was down to Triple H to take the heat by default. The plan was originally for Triple H to win the 1996 King of the Ring tournament, but that plan was quickly taken off the table after the incident and he faced a period of wrestling in the mid-card as a consequence, where McMahon tried to humiliate him as often as possible. Many of their peers in the locker room breathed a sigh of relief that the click was no more. In an interview, Bret Hart said, They were a cancer in the dressing room. All of them. I don't doubt that Shawn Michaels is sorry for a lot of that kind of behaviour. Kevin Nash was a good guy, but I don't think he could be that proud of that association. It was a cancerous environment in the dressing room with those guys, and they certainly did more negative than positive to the business. In WCW, Hall and Nash were instrumental in the creation of the New World Order. The Outsiders, as they became known, even managed to antagonise Vince McMahon from a distance as the NWO were presented as invaders from the WWF in all but name. While the NWO were the cause of WCW's massive ratings and popularity spike, Hall and Nash, along with Hogan, ran roughshod over the company with their constant politics. It would be those politics that would contribute towards WCW's downfall in the end. Back in the WWF, Triple H and Michaels created a faction that embodied the brand new Attitude Era, Degeneration X. 
It was a team that was born out of the clique itself, and their crude on-screen antics helped to increase the WWF's popularity during the late 90s. Sean Waltman found himself in a unique position. Due to his close ties to the clique members, he seamlessly moved between the WWF and WCW. In WCW, he joined the NWO, and then when he returned to the WWF in 1998, he was reintroduced as X-Pac and became a key player in D-Generation X himself. His ability to navigate between both companies demonstrated the power of the clique and their influence over the business, even when they weren't together as a whole unit. The influence of the clique on professional wrestling is undeniable. They were a group who held power and weren't afraid to use it, mostly at the expense of others. It ensured that all five men achieved longevity in the wrestling business that still exists to this day.